We talk about money and politics, and it's clearly the issue confronting this country. I mean, you have to open up the hood on any number of things, but if you could get somehow the money out of our political process, you do so much to increase the purity of the people's voice in the elections. But that said, what actually happens with that money? This is a story about that. And that's really what I love about this particular part of the conversation. Dave Leventhal joins us, and Dave is the editor at large at the Center for Public Integrity. Dave, welcome to the conversation. Hey, Mark, good to be with you. I I love that you're here, as I say, because you know we talk about money and politics, but now let's really just put a face on this that has a little more detail. One of the things that money does is that moneyed interests. Uh, pursue very various legislative agendas, and they actually pursue legislation that they write, those moneyed interests write. Take us through some of that process, will you? Well, sure, we've seen this at the local, the state, and the federal level, and in fact, uh, we just put forth a project last year in conjunction with USA Today in the Arizona Republic that showed that a various special interests, in fact, hundreds upon hundreds of special interests, will oftentimes get behind what we like to call model legislation. Now, what is model legislation? Model legislation, very simply, are bills that are not written by lawmakers. They're not written by your elected representatives. They're written by special interests. That may be a corporate special interest, in some cases a union special interest. But be that what it may, uh, these are copycat bills. They, They are quite literally cut and pasted, and they might be introduced in one, two, 10, 20, even 50 states with effectively verbatim language. So instead of getting something from your local representatives, you're getting something from your national special interest that could have profound effects on the way that your locality is actually being run and being governed. this This is remarkable because what you're seeing is your local legislators face on it, your local legislators name on it, but that's just almost a shell company for what is legislation that is written by these moneyed interests. Well, in a way, it's outsourcing of the legislative process. Instead of having that elected lawmaker or his or her staff writing the bill, you're having something that effectively is being given to that legislator and then being introduced through the legislative process. So in many cases, it's unclear to the public that this is even happening. And we now have a tracker tool that you can go and you can search for yourself. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, if you have a special interest yourself uh, in an issue, a topic, you can type that in. It might be marijuana, it might be uh, taxes, it could be any topic under the political sun. And you can find out if that bill is being introduced in your, say, home state of Kansas and also Idaho and Ohio and Florida and California and everywhere else around the country. It's something that you couldn't do before and you can do now. I, I, I mean, I, I just want to, I don't want to move on from this too quickly because this is a really cool thing you're talking about. There's an algorithm that looks at language and you can actually see that this language in so many of these different bills is the same. And in so doing, you can identify where these moneyed interests have spread that bill or that legislation across the country. Well, a, a labor of love from a, an incredible data journalist, uh, Pratik Rabala at the Center for Public Integrity, who uh, spearheaded the creation of this. So yes, exactly as you describe it, you can go and you can search for yourself to determine if there is copycat legislation being introduced in your state or if there's copycat legislation, again, on a topic that you care about being introduced all throughout the country and who's behind that as well. You know, this, when I saw it, made me think of like a Sinclair broadcasting where they buy up a bunch of stations across the country and then they they crank out these uh, must runs, they call them, you know, pieces of news that really reflect opinion or a point of view without telling the audience that this is stuff that we put together and we've omitted key facts or whatever it may be. And that goes out to all the Sinclair stations. So it's run nationwide. This reminds me on a legislative basis of just that phenomenon. Well, there are legislative engines, these copycat legislation engines that exist. Probably one that would be familiar to most people is ALEC. Uh, ALEC is a group of uh, very conservative-minded entities that oftentimes will sponsor model legislation of this sort. So you see model legislation coming from the right, from conservative sources for sure. Also too, it's something that has been used and utilized 
on the left, uh, albeit to a lesser degree. So both sides, to some extent, uh, are playing this game. And it uh, again, the reason we did this project, which included uh, a numbers of articles, uh, several dozen articles in addition to this tracker that we just talked about, is so people can realize, number one, that this stuff exists, but also to the effect on it and how it affects uh, just uh, across the board so many issues, including a lot of pocketbook issues that affect people's bottom lines and the way that you live your life, food, cars, you name it, model legislation, there's a good chance that uh, there's something out there that uh, exactly hits on one of those topics. In a moment, I want to get to the election. But before we leave this topic, I'm glad you mentioned that you know both sides do it to an extent. Uh, we see it more on the right uh, and through the GOP. But uh, this is what's good about your program, about this sort of algorithm, as you can see. I mean, maybe it's legislation that you actually are okay with. But you can also see uh, some of the really disturbing legislation, the anti-Islamic uh, legislation that's passing uh, through these various legislative bodies. Uh, the anti, uh, uh, well, the uh, there's a car dealer, piece of car dealer legislation that I was reading about that also seemed kind of, uh, right. shall we say, sketchy. And you know, we've talked to plenty of people who are, uh, if not supporters of the notion of model legislation, will make the case that model legislation in and of itself is not inherently bad. It's not inherently evil. It's a technique, a tool, a political vehicle for uh, trying to propagate something that people believe in. Well, at its face, that, that might sound perfectly fine. Uh, the problem is when the public doesn't realize that legislation, again, as we just discussed, isn't coming necessarily from lawmakers, it's coming from somewhere else, but has the imprimatur of a lawmaker, has their name on it, uh, has her name on it, and is going forward as uh, something that ultimately it really isn't. That's the thing. You know, we think of this as a, a process by which we elect officials that have shared with us their philosophy, their outlook, uh, those things that they feel are important, their priorities, if you will. And then to see that whole thing sort of subverted or undermined in this way, and, and they just uh, get, in essence, a, a, an email that outlines the verbiage for the next piece of legislation because they, in a sense, are taken hostage by big moneyed interests. That's disturbing. But uh, there's, there's a reason we call lawmakers lawmakers because they're supposed to make laws. So uh, the fact that, that that's not happening all the time uh, kind of undercuts the notion that they truly are the ones who are making those laws and passing those bills. Now on to uh, the election and the FEC, you know, the Federal Election Commission. You did a great piece, I thought, about just this fact, which is that uh, Donald Trump, the FEC critical, right, in, uh, in safeguarding elections. Tell everybody about the FEC and then we'll talk about what's happening to it. Well, in short, the Federal Election Commission was created in the ashes of Watergate. It was set up to be a civil law enforcement body that was going to enforce and regulate the nation's campaign laws in a central bipartisan fashion, and also to take care of the, uh, the transparency element of campaign finance, making sure that the public, that the press, everyone had access to information coming from campaigns about how much money they're raising, how much money they're spending if they go into debt, or any other financial consideration. So 45 years later though, the FEC is uh, not necessarily lived up to those lofty expectations that it was going to be a cop on the beat. And right now, Mark, as we speak right now, the uh, Federal Election Commission doesn't have enough commissioners to take care of that law enforcement component of its duty. It doesn't have a quorum, and until it gets one of at least four commissioners on the six commissioner body, the FEC is pretty much dead in the water when it comes to enforcing the nation's campaign finance laws. And this was a deliberate act, was it not? Well, it's a deliberate act in the sense that the president of the United States has to nominate Federal Election Commission commissioners. The US Senate has to go ahead and improve those nominees. And Donald Trump has only put forward one person, a man by the name of Trey Trainer, whose nomination has since lapsed in the past couple of weeks. But we can blame to an extent Barack Obama and George W. Bush for this too, because both of them had opportunities themselves to inject new blood into the Federal Election Commission to, uh, to either appoint new commissioners, nominate new commissioners, or for that matter, fill the jobs of commissioners who have overstayed their terms. And this has been a habitual problem over the past many years for the FEC. Commissioners are only supposed to be there six years, but 
All the commissioners at one point in time not long ago had overstayed their terms, and then they began to fall away. They resigned, they went elsewhere, and now we only have three commissioners left. Uh, I've talked to two of those three who weren't able even to answer the question when I posed it to them as to whether they're willing to stay throughout 2020, not that there's a whole lot for them to do at this point. So things could get worse at the FEC before they get better, and they're pretty darn bleak right now. Why would there be a, and we're running out of time here, I'm sorry, but I, but I do have to ask you, why would there be an interest in sort of defanging the FEC from, as you suggest, sort of both parties? Why would you let something that seems such a, a critical part of the democratic process lapse like this? Well, we focus in our story today at the Center for Public Integrity on one particular case uh, among 300 plus that we could have chosen from that uh, are, are not being taken care of, cases that the FEC should be looking into. And, and that's one that involves Donald Trump himself. Uh, there is a complaint from Representative Bill Pascrell, congressman from New Jersey, and he's basically saying, hey, look, FEC, you need to look into the way that Donald Trump is accounting for bills that he is receiving from municipal governments all across the country for police protection at his different campaign rallies. He's not doing it the right way. He's not accounting for it properly. That's the case that's being made. The FEC got back to him and said, well, uh, we can't do anything about it because we don't have enough commissioners to see this complaint through. And well, who's the person who would nominate FEC commissioners to give the FEC the ability to investigate that complaint? Donald Trump. So you can see right there that this is an issue, particularly when you have the person who is the subject to a complaint, the president of the United States, also responsible for nominating commissioners to the FEC, which is tasked with investigating those types of complaints. It feels more like a banana republic every day in this country, just insanity. Uh, Dave Leventhal, love your stuff, Center for Public Integrity. The website is publicintegrity.org, check it out. So much great stuff, so many terrific revelations. Thanks for spending time with us today. Hey, my pleasure, have a great night.